I'd like to introduce Austin Kirpis, who's one of our awesome JavaScript developers. So this is my talk, um, an introduction to WebRTC. So what is WebRTC? <clears throat> so WebRTC is capable of streaming audio, video, and raw data between participants of a session. Um, you probably guessed by now that uh, RTC is short for real-time communications. So WebRTC is, is real-time. Of course, communication facilita facilitated by WebRTC is not truly real-time, um, but it's very low latency, almost instantaneous. Uh, in fact, WebRTC is faster than WebSockets. Um, for those of you who don't know much about WebRTC, you may be kind of wondering how that's possible. Um, so that kind of brings us to the next part. Um, WebRTC is fundamentally peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, meaning communications between two participants is direct and does not involve a server. Um, so you may also be wondering how that's possible. Um, when I say no servers involved, I mean strictly speaking for the actual communication aspect. Um, you do need a server to establish the connection or to assist in establishing that initial connection. Essentially, clients just need to know who they're talking to on the other side and how to reach them through various layers of network address translation and you know, potentially firewalls and other, other network conditions. <clears throat> so that brings us to interactive connectivity establishments or ICE as it is commonly referred. Um, so I won't go too far into how ICE works, um, but later it'll be helpful to at least understand uh, session traversal using, or sorry, session traversal utilities for NAT, also known as um, STUN. Um, so STUN is the protocol that I kind of talked about a little bit earlier. Um, essentially, it helps you find out you know, what a peer's IP address is, what ports they have open to the internet, and a few other conditions about their network so that you know how, how you can make a direct connection to them. Um, so there is also something called uh, traversal using relays around NAT, which is used as a fallback. This is another thing that, that ICE did use it is. Um, so in cases where you can't create uh, a direct connection between peers, it acts as a middleman to proxy the data from one peer to another. Um, so if you really want to dig into this, there's an RFC for all these protocols. Uh, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, and depending on what tools you're using for WebRTC, you won't really need to know much about this stuff to build a successful application. Um, for a lot of the basic cases, this stuff is it, 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 is not necessary. So that's why I'm not you know, digging super deep. <clears throat> so one of the confusing things about WebRTC, or at least it confused me for a little bit, um, WebRTC isn't strictly speaking peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, Turn can take over as a proxy um, when a direct connection is not, um, not uh, possible. Um, there's also several architectures that intentionally avoid direct peer-to-peer -peer connections with WebRTC. So I'm going to talk over some of these architectures. So um, first off, we have mesh, which is the peer-to-peer -peer way of doing things. So with the mesh architecture, all peers connect directly to all other peers. Um, with this architecture, each peer will have number of peers minus one connections. The primary advantage here is putting all of the work on the clients in the part, uh, that are participating in the session. Um, and as an added bonus, this is the lowest latency option because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. There's nothing in the middle. Um, so since connections grow exponentially for each peer who's added to this mesh network, um, the downside is that it needs a fast network to perform, what, perform well, and it's not able to scale to a large number of concurrent peers. Uh, the highest number of concurrent peers I'm aware of a mesh, a mesh WebRTC RTC application achieving is uh, 100, and that is um, Google Hangouts, in case anyone's wondering. Um, so the next architectural option is known as MCU, uh, multi-point conferencing unit. Um, so that's where all peers connect to a server that handles mixing the audio and video into a single stream, and then it forwards that to each individual peer. Uh, with this approach, you have one connection per peer. Um, the primary advantage to this approach is that it requires less connections and thus requires less bandwidth and is more scalable. So for apps where you have more than 100 participants or maybe you want to record sessions, this is a very common pattern to use. Um, there's a conferencing app called BlueJeans that uses this approach. Um, you can look into that if you're, if you're curious about you know, what the user experience is and everything. Um, so the final architecture, um, the final common one anyway, is uh, called SFU or Selective 4 
This is where all peers connect to a server that proxies each string separately to all other peers. With this architecture, each peer will have the same number of connections as there are peers in the session. The primary advantage to this approach <clears throat> is that sessions can easily be recorded by the SFU, but the client still has separate streams to control and display independently. Um, the downside to this approach is that it requires the highest number of connections and thus the most bandwidth, so it's not as scalable. Um, there's a uh, really popular open source SFU called Janus Gateway um, that I think until recently Slack was using. I know at some point they used them. Um, but yeah, Janus open source project, uh, recommend checking it out. It's definitely worth taking a look. Um, so Mesh is sort of the standard out of the box way of using WebRTC. Um, and the MCU and F SFU approaches require implementing an intermediate on the server to you know, actually handle um, the, the proxying of media and everything, which is a separate thing from turn. Um, again, that's, you know, turn isn't something you really need to, to dig into quite yet. Um, so to recap, <clears throat> if your app needs to record sessions, then SFU and MCU are probably what you want. If you need to scale to a really large number of users um, or have decent performance on really slow networks, MCU is going to be your best bet. Um, if you need the lowest possible latency and network speed isn't a hindrance, mesh, mesh is what you want. Um, so what can I do with WebRTC? Um, the answer is a whole lot of things. Uh, some of the more notable examples are building a video conferencing application. Um, as I mentioned before, Google Hangouts is a really good example of this kind of thing. Um, we also have a client, actually, for uh, Batobi as a client, um, that is using WebRTC to build uh, audio and video conferencing applications for surgeons to use um, to collaborate and teach in real time while operating on live patients. It's a really cool thing um, that you know, was sort of made possible by, by WebRTC, or made accessible rather, because the only other solution like this involves spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on hardware, um, you know, and we helped this client build it through a web browser. So it's extremely powerful. Um, you can also build a soft phone. Uh, Twilio offers a server or a service, sorry, that uses WebRTC to connect to users' browsers to a public switch telephone network or PSTN. So that allows them to dial out and receive calls from inside their browser. Companies like Five9 and Zendesk are leveraging this to modernize call centers. It's really cool stuff. So finally, um, you can also build a torrent client that runs in your web browser. Because remember, you can send raw data and binary through a WebRTC connection. Um, so there's a really cool library out there called WebTorrent. Um, highly recommend checking it out. If you're interested in doing this sort of thing, it'll take care of all the heavy lifting for you. Um, and they have a really neat demo on their homepage as well. Um, so I've named uh, a few really neat ways you can use WebRTC. Um, I'm sure you can already imagine there's a whole lot more you can do with it. Um, so let's Let's go into a demo here real quick. <clears throat> so um, I put together this little demo. I based it off of one of the, um, uh, the pre-existing demos out there on the web. Um, so for the, the purposes of simplicity, this is a one-way video call, and both peers are happening in the same browser window. Um, this is not a limitation of, of WebRTC. This is just the easiest way of demoing it. So I'm going to hit start, and you'll see that two videos of me appear. So this one to the left is actually the local peer. So this is basically taking it straight out of my webcam, spitting it out on the page. The one on the right is actually sending the video over a peer connection to a second peer and then displaying it. And it's probably going to be hard to see on Zoom, but you can see there's a little bit of latency between them, and the right one is also slightly lower resolution. That's because it's actually being streamed through WebRTC. Um, probably not super noticeable over Zoom, but when you play around with it locally, you can see it. Um, very subtle. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump back into the presentation real quick, and <clears throat> then we'll talk um, about how I do WebRTC, or how you can do WebRTC. Um, so you might be wondering, do I need tools or frameworks? Um, you actually don't need much for the basics. Um, so let's run through what you need for a really basic setup, um, the simple one-way video call that I just demoed. So you need a stun server. Um, the cool thing about this is 
you can use a free public one. Um, Google, Firefox, all the big players in the web have their own free public stun server that you can use for non-commercial use. Um, the next thing you need is a modern web browser. Um, newer versions of Chrome, Firefox, and even Safari. There are some, some uh, caveats to using Safari for WebRTC. You can look those up. There's lots of Stack Overflow posts about it. Um, but it's, it's coming along. So um, it's pretty widely supported at this point. Um, the next thing you need is a moderate understanding of JavaScript. Um, nothing crazy. If you can call functions and assign variables and uh, await promises, then you're going to be good to go. Um, so with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at some code now. Um, so this is the code that I, um, that I wrote to, to make that demo that we just saw work. Um, so the first, uh, the first thing to note here is um, navigator.mediadevices.getusermedia. Um, so all of these APIs um, are native to the browser. There's no libraries included for this. Um, it, so this, this get user media thing is um, a somewhat new API. It's a few years old, somewhere around the age of WebRTC. Um, and essentially, it allows you to uh, query for media devices on the machine. So in this case, I'm saying um, get user media. I don't need audio. I need video. Um, that's why it says audio false, video true. Um, you, can, you can pass this a lot of more advanced parameters. You can even specify like the resolution of the video you want. Um, but for the basic setup, you know, just tell it I need audio, I need video. And what that will do is it will asynchronously return a uh, media stream. Um, the media stream is a representation of that user media. So in this case, my webcam feed, right? Um, so we take that media stream and we um, set it to the source object property of local video. Local video is just a pointer to a video element. So on our page, it was the left side, um, said it was called local video and, and had PC1 in parentheses, right? So at this point, we're displaying the local preview for our WebRTC setup, right? So next, we go over here and we create a couple of peer connections. So usually in, in like a real application, you would pass some parameters into RTC peer connection when you instantiate it. Um, and you may pass in stun servers. Um, so each browser has its own defaults. And like I said, you're free to use them as long as it's for non-commercial purposes. So in this case, using stun is kind of invisible to us. It sets it up in the background, but it's still there. So next, we add a couple of listeners, um, one on each peer connection for ICE candidates. Um, so I won't get too much into um, what ICE candidates are, because again, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, but you'll see that on peer one, we listen for ICE candidates, and then we add them to peer two, and vice versa. On peer two, we listen for ICE candidates, and we add them to peer one. <clears throat> so in a real application where this is two different browsers, you would use something called signaling to send the ICE candidates from one peer to the other, usually via WebSockets. And that's, again, just for the initial connection, you don't need that to maintain uh, communication down the line. So the next step is um, we take our media stream and we get all of the tracks. So if you have audio and video, you'll have two tracks. Um, one for audio and one for video, of course. It's also possible to have more than one video track or more than one audio track, but this is kind of the, you know, typically you'll have two, one for audio, one for video. So next on Peer Connection 2, we add an event listener for track. Um, so we'll come back to this later um, and kind of explain what it's doing. Um, but, you know, it's important to do that first. So next what we do is on Peer Connection 1, we create an SDP offer or Session Description Protocol offer. Um, so SDP is a way for each peer to describe the parameters of the media they're about to send. Um, it's, um, SDP is actually like a two-step two, two step process. We'll get into that next. But we, we take this SDP offer and we set the local description on peer one and the remote description on peer two to that offer. <clears throat> then we create an SDP answer. So this is the other side of it. This is like the second part of the SDP handshake. Um, so when you create an answer and you set that, it is the final step of, of this handshake initiating the connection. And you can see down here, we, we set the local description on peer two, 
and we set the remote description on peer one, completing the handshake. So at this point in time, the connection will be established and then asynchronously, this track event listener will fire. Um, it'll pass in uh, an event with streams on it and you take the first stream out of that. I guess theoretically it's possible to have two, but I, I don't, uh, I haven't seen that in the wild yet and I still don't understand what the use case for that is. Um, but what we do is we use this pointer, remote video, that's um, a pointer to the second video element on the page to the right. And we set its source object property to this instance of media stream. And we have now completed the WebRTC handshake and we're displaying both the local and the remote peers. And that's it. Awesome, thank you, Austin. Uh, so, does anyone have questions before uh, we move on? Yeah, Rob. Hi. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I, I have one. Um, that was a pretty complex handshake. When you, yes. do, um, when you do like handshakes with people or can we develop a really complex handshake to match the complexity of RTC next time we hang out? Yes, I'm, awesome. I'm completely down for this. Cool, sounds good. The Batobi handshake. Uh, Rob had a good question in the chat about what architecture, uh, which of the um, of the uh, types or protocols uh, Zoom probably uses. Uh, I believe Zoom uses the SFU approach. Um, That's the one with the uh, proxy. Yeah, so you proxy each stream individually. Because um, yeah. if you play around with their UI, you'll notice that you have really responsive control over like pinning a video to the center. And if you were using the MCU approach, there'd be sort of a delay between saying, I want this video centered and it actually, because you know, you're basically sending a message to the server then and saying, hey, make a composite with this video in the center now and then ship everyone that, or ship me that, I guess. Um, and so that, that's a little bit uh, delayed, um, whereas this is a really snappy experience. So I, I think it's using the SFU approach, but I'm not sure. It may not even be using WebRTC under the hood. It's not exactly a web application.